last session of day two, we're very excited to have Christina Furtado, Gardney's mental wellness specialist, um, with us here today to talk about a really important topic, uh, I think, for all of us, especially as we go into the workforce around mental wellness, mental health issues, and, you know, when to conceal and when to reveal. So what rights do you have? Um, you know, in terms of what you need to share regarding your mental wellness, um, whether, you know, with an employer or otherwise. So we're super happy to have her here. And with that, I will um, just hand it right over to her. Hello, everyone. I hope that you are all doing well. Um, and today's web, today's presentation is a little bit different um, with regards to sort of the intention behind it. And as Jesse had mentioned, um, you know, we're looking at trying to provide you with a bit of guidance around breaking the stigma that does surround different mental health topics as well as other disabilities. And when you are joining the workforce, you have lived experience as a student as to what your strengths are, what um, some of the challenges may be in order for you to really fulfill your greatest potential. So it's not only necessarily about mental illness or other disabilities, but really being a self-advocate for the various needs that um, you have in order to fulfill your best um, outcomes. Now it is customary out of respect for our Canadian history and culture to offer a land acknowledgement. So before we dive into today's content, um, I would like to, for us all to just take a moment to recognize that today's presentation is being held on the traditional and unceded territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Nishabe, the Chippewa, as well as the Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples. Now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, we acknowledge and pay tribute to all Aboriginal peoples who live either in the Greater Toronto region or elsewhere in Canada and beyond. We honor their courageous leaders of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So thank you very much. Now, I think that at some point we have heard, um, you know, that life's not fair or, you know, suck it up or all of these wonderful terms that really capture sort of people's perception that when you are struggling, you're just supposed to deal with it. And whatever challenges you that come across your path, just deal with it. And that really is a false message. Um, and we've heard it from many different people. I know for myself, I heard it from my own mother growing up um, and I absolutely hated it. But the one thing that I wanna sort of highlight is that there is a bit of truth in the sense of that life's not fair. And it reminds us that regardless of what our paths are, regardless of what our life has been, we eventually, just because we're human, will need to face disappointment. We'll need to face setbacks, failures, and even loss and trauma. And what we need to do is be better equipped to deal with those difficult situations. And the reason I bring this up is because as we face various challenges, and it really sort of pulls a strain on what our strategies are to cope. It highlights where some of those challenges are for us. And again, I'm not speaking of illnesses per se, but more of those obstacles that can impact our overall health and well being. Now, any demand that's placed on our body or even our brain does impact our overall wellness and health. So when we're looking at, you know, being able to determine whether or not we want to share with someone else what our struggles may be or our challenges may be, we really want to take it from the perspective of what is our intention? What do we want to achieve? And I think just given your dedication to the Campus Ambassador Program, each of you have shown that all you want to do is your best. And we need to be okay with what that is based on our own individual expectations, not that of others. So when we're looking at our health and really trying to establish whether or not we're comfortable um, with sharing where our challenges may be, we need to understand it ourselves. And it does start with ourselves. So when we're looking at health, you know, we quite commonly sort of put into practice a lot of different strategies and techniques and, and even activities into our daily routines to focus and solidify 
our physical health, which is that's our bodies, right? So how our bodies are. And we do different things to, to make our bodies feel healthy and feel well. And that definitely contributes to our ability to do things in effective ways. But what we don't necessarily pay attention to as much is our mental health. And that's really just in its simplest form, how our minds are. And when we look at our minds, it's our thoughts, it's our feelings, our emotions, and then more importantly, it's those behaviors. So it's those actions. What thoughts we have clutter our minds, they trigger certain feelings, and then because of all of those two pieces, it affects what it is we're going to do next. So naturally, we all have different priorities, different approaches, aspirations, even including our own view of what sort of means to live life fully. And when we're talking about wellness, it's really looking at it from a holistic approach. So holistic just means from different angles and, and every component that makes us human. So from our physical, our mental, and even our spiritual well-being, it fuels our body. It engages our mind and really nurtures that spirit that we have. And every aspect of our life influences our state of well-being. So as you're starting to think about your path and your journey, whether it be to join the workforce if you haven't already, or maybe it's continuing in your studies, regardless of what it is, you want to equip yourself with an inventory of tools and techniques in order for you to be successful within that particular journey. And although you know we always strive for this optimal health, it's really, wellness is really more about living that life to the best of your ability. It's a lifestyle. It's a personalized approach to living things in life in a way that allows you the best kind of person, the potential circumstances and fate will allow. So when we're dealing with stressors, more particularly, that really highlights a lot of the different challenges we have. And if you are someone that has been diagnosed with a mental illness um, or other mental health concerns, you've had that lived experience and that journey to know the challenges that you face. However, what we need to appreciate is regardless of a diagnosis, we all have mental health doesn't mean that we're ill. It just means that we need guidance and support to help us stay within that excelling and thriving state of being. And when we're challenged with something that is stressful or upsetting, it really just changes our perspective about things. And that is normal. It's a biological response, actually, that all humans have. That's what stress does. It's a survival tool, if you will. Now, the impact that certain situations have on us really does stress and identify where we need support and what type of strategies can help us work through those stress aspects. Now, your body is designed to sort of react to stress in a way that protects you from threats such as predators. Now, obviously facing life threatening predators is not common today for some of us. <laughs> and though we do have daily demands and those daily demands, once you join the workforce are going to change. So when we are trying to advocate for ourselves or become an advocate for others, it's really appreciating that we all experience situations through different lenses. And though as humans, we have the same thing in common, and that is our body reacts to stress because that is a biological function. We release stress hormones, we release emotions, and we have thoughts. What's unique is how that all plays out for each of us. So when we are identifying where, you know, certain situations that you thrive in, it's about paying attention now to what is about that situation? What is about certain relationships that you do thrive in? Is it a matter of structure? Is it a matter of um, timelines? Is it a matter of complete independence? Whatever the case may, may be, those are characteristics that can be applicable to a work environment. And though employers won't think about the unique needs of their employees, that's just not 
the situation. They have a job in mind and they want to look for the person that's going to, going to fulfill that particular um, spot. What you want to do is highlight where your strengths are, but more importantly, advocate for the additional supports and accommodations that you will need in order to fulfill that to the fullest potential. So now's the time, identify what it is that, or how it is that your body reacts to stress um, and looking at those negative type of impacts that it may have on you. So whether it be concentration or um, you tend to isolate or you tend to procrastinate um, or you tend to become emotional, whatever the case may be, you're in a time right now where you need to, to really highlight those various components, identify what it is and how stress feels to you. So then you can identify those various coping strategies that can be effective in managing it in a controlled way, but more importantly, identify various techniques and strategies that can be also beneficial to you within the workplace. Now, when we're looking at our, how our body handles stress, this does help us in really indicating where those subtle shifts happen within our body. Because the reality is when we are experiencing stress to any degree, um, if we think about it on a continuum similar to a thermometer where it's you know, low on the end and then as we have more stress, it sort of intensifies and, and it becomes a little bit more difficult to manage various tasks because of the stress that we're feeling, it can happen quite quickly. So we really need to know what to do. So when our body actually releases and handles stress in two different ways, um, hormonal as well as nervous system. I won't go into a lot of detail, it's on your screen, you can read it. And though what's really important is regardless of the situation that is causing the stress, those two components are still involved. So if it's a good stress, like um, you know, a test or an exam or a promotion or an opportunity that you've been working hard for, your body will still release that stress hormone. Um, your nervous system is still involved with regards to how your body is actually sending those messages to your brain about that situation. So when we're looking at trying to establish a little bit more of um, a framework, if you will, of what is working for you and what is not working for you, you really need to dive into your experience with stress as a student, as just even a human on day-to-day -day life um, experiences and being an international student away from home that has its own challenges, which I'm sure you have all shared. Um, and though those are stressors that are completely valid and a good example for you of how did you deal with that? What sort of techniques were you able to introduce into your routines, um, into your toolbox of tricks, if you will, to help you manage that during your time as a student? Because that's going to be helpful for you um, down the road long term when there are additional stressors that come into play because of a workplace environment. So regardless of the experience with stress, we all you know, can identify and appreciate that stress for each of us is different. Um, and though the re recipe for stress is universal and so are the various ingredients. So if you've been in other webinars and presentations I've done, I have spoken about this before because I think it's really important. Um, because as we, again, look at different responsibilities, different experiences, different expectations, um, given the path that we're going to take, the workplace has a lot of different situations that you have not yet experienced as a student. Um, so we really want to equip ourselves with sort of an infiltrate of um, tools and techniques that can help us work through them without greatly impacting us in a negative way. So when we're looking at those ingredients, uh, which is nuts, so novelty, unpredictability, threats to ego, and sense of control, the more ingredients means the more stress. So when you're faced with a situation or um, and even anticipating a situation that involves one of these elements, it releases that stress hormone. 
Now, obviously we'd love to have different hormones for different stressors. That's just not realistic and that's just not gonna happen. So we need to better prepare ourselves with knowing what it is we can sort of intervene at what point um, and start identifying the various strategies that we have in our toolbox that can really lessen it um, from impacting what we need to do with regards to our roles, um, our jobs, or even our home lives. Now, the nature of work um, and just the workplace is changing, and it's a, it's a pretty quick speed of change. And perhaps now more than ever uh, before, job or workplace stress poses quite a bit of a threat to the health of individuals. Um, there is growing global concern about the impact of job stress, especially given the unique circumstances of remote type of environments. And though when we're looking at that skill set, we can see that some of those potential work-related stressors that I've identified here can actually be something that you've already experienced as a student. So how have you fared? How have you um, overcome that particular stressor? Or maybe you haven't. So potential causes, overwork. So as a student, trying to manage all the different expectations, trying to um, look at lack of clear instructions from your teachers or unrealistic deadlines or lack of decision making. Those four, first four are common trends, if you will, that you as students have experienced that you will continue to experience even within a workplace environment. Now, job security, given the unique time right now, is something that we um, are all fearing and there's a lot of unknown around that. So it's really dealing with an uncertainty um, around that and isolated work conditions, even with regards to observations. So I know that Jesse had mentioned, um, our colleague Steve had talked about emotional intelligence and sort of reading the room when it comes to presentations. Um, it's the same within a workplace environment that can actually help lessen stress or contribute to stress increasing which then impacts your ability to, to have that clear mind and be able to plan, problem solve, strategize, and really act in a way that's going to be effective and productive. When I'm talking about observation though, it's not only about what it is that you're seeing in the room and sort of reading the room, but it's also appreciating that, you know, you need to, to stop and listen. Um, to understand what someone is saying and not for the purpose of replying. So that also falls within that emotional intelligence that you've spoken of already. And though that's a critical factor to actually um, solidifying what it is your emotional intelligence is, if you have that ability to sort of do both. It's important really to develop that skill set and really establish that self-awareness of where your own stress management techniques are now um, as a truthful inventory of not only what your mental well-being is, but the impact um, that it may cause down the road if additional stresses are added onto your plate. So as you're looking for employment or really deciding the path that you're going to take, you find, we find ourselves in a very unique position. And, and frankly, I look at it as a positive opportunity to really start developing and identifying what your personal plan for managing life's challenges are going to be. It's not highlighting what your challenges are. It's a matter of highlighting where your strengths are and what it is with regards to what you know you need in order to fulfill your best potential. Now, though mental health in itself is at the forefront of most media um, on most days today, there are still many people with a lack of knowledge, uh, fueling a stigma around mental health and mental illness that still hasn't been lifted. And depending on what country of origin you're from or even where you reside now and where you're looking for employment, that still might be the case. That is a barrier and a challenge that we are continuously struggling and fighting against. So today it's really identifying that regardless of the term mental illness, the one thing that we can advocate for is our own mental well-being. 
And when it comes to illness, that's where we look for others to support us. That's looking for others with regards to guidance and sort of providing us with a bit of our own understanding. And with all of our experience, regardless of what our backgrounds are, regardless of our education, we have experience to learn from. We have experience to teach someone else about. And that really is the fuel behind lessening the stigma around these perceptions and myths that exist of mental health. So you're going to start doing that. I've continued to do that. And I really look at planting the seed um, at the end of today's web presentation to be that sense of compassion and understanding that regardless of what your challenges are, uh, regardless of what you are comfortable with sharing or not, you can hear someone else's story without judgment. Because everyone has a different life and therefore a different battle to fight every day. And we have no idea what is happening inside someone's minds or behind closed doors. And our minds, let's be honest, for some can be a very scary place and a very cluttered place with a lot of chaos that we're trying to work through. And that's normal when we have all of these various thoughts and experiences that we're trying to make sense of and put in compartments of priority. And when you're being thrown various demands, it's hard and it makes things messy inside. So when we aren't allowed to really function in our day-to-day -day routine, we start to see sort of cracks in our foundation in the sense of we start seeing where things aren't necessarily effective long-term, but more of temporary mechanisms that we've been using to just get by and clear the dust away. The stigma around mental health currently, coupled with, let's be honest, intense competition not only from an academic perspective, but also employment and career-driven environments make it really difficult for us to talk about our challenges, our struggles, or even where you know, we aren't necessarily the best in. So getting people to listen and to really understand the perspectives of people that are struggling with mental illness is as important as it is for us to talk about our day-to-day -day challenges because so far I haven't met one person that's absolutely perfect because perfection doesn't exist, but yet it's something that we are told to strive for. Changes in our mental health and our mental well-being can strike at any time for any particular reason. So by discussing what our experiences are openly, we reduce that isolation, we reduce that shame and resist and reduce that resistance to seeking out just guidance and support someone to talk to. We are all human and not feeling our best every day, well, that's okay and frankly, that's normal. So coping skills help us process and it helps us deal with life challenges and stressors as well as our struggles and our emotions. And even if we have someone that has and is struggling with a mental illness, they also have to have coping skills in order to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Coping skills help us process and balance our overall health. So that's our physical as well as our mental health. So when we're trying to manage multiple sources of stress, it really again highlights the effectiveness of the coping skills that we already have in our toolbox whether it be going for a run, going to the gym, um, talking to a friend, writing in a journal, maybe it's going and praying or meditating, things of that nature. Those are various techniques and activities that we engage in when we're feeling awful, when we're feeling you know, not our best, and we do those to make ourselves feel better. That's exactly what a coping skill does. That is the intention behind it. What we need to learn how to do is really identify what of those coping strategies actually make me feel good for a longer period of time versus those quick fixes. Because when you do join a workforce and you do establish your career and things do change and deadlines happen, expectations happen and job performances happen and you really have various responsibilities that you're trying to fulfill simultaneously, you better be equipped with pretty good coping skills. 
now's the time. So believe in your own ability to deal with stress and give, you know, a couple of new activities a try and see what, you know, and how you can turn something that may feel negative, may feel overwhelming to an opportunity of positive growth and even just better management. So some things that I've sort of highlighted as a starting point for that is first and foremost, just recognize that and really accept and appreciate that even if you feel that sensation of, of anxiousness, which is worry, which is fear, um, which is stress, that's normal. Um, identify what it means in that particular circumstance. Try to really name it um, and break it down into smaller chunks. Is it about speaking in front of people um, that make you feel stressed? Is it about those timelines? Is it about um, not having clear instructions? Is it about having to work with your hands? Is it having to talk for a long period of time? Whatever the case may be, those are aspects that really are going to make the difference for you as well as for your potential employer. There are certain circumstances that we are just not able to change um, when it comes to other environments and situations that do raise those stress levels. So by breaking it already down and identifying what particular hot spots are for you, those hot buttons of, of stressors, then you can really pinpoint what can you change or what do you need to accept? And when we look at acceptance, it's just a matter of knowing that it is what it is and you need to change your perspective around it. So whether it be workplace environments, school, family, life, doesn't really, doesn't really matter. Stress is stress. The reason behind the stress really is going to dictate what type of um, approach we are going to do in order to better manage that stress level. So there's four different ways that we can take on and challenge stress and in essence sort of boss it back, if you will. Um, it's either we change the situation or we change our reaction. Those are really the only two buckets. Now we can avoid certain things and let's be honest, um, there are a lot of situations that cause stress that we can't simply avoid. And from a perspective, from a mental health perspective, I would advocate that avoidance is probably one of the one of the worst and unhealthy coping strategies that you can possibly do. So you wanna look at altering, you wanna look at really adapting and just accepting. And when it comes to your reaction, that is the one thing that you have the utmost control and power over. Use it now, because that's what's going to fuel your ability to advocate for various things that you are going to need, not only in your family, not only in school, but again, in that workplace environment. Now, as I've mentioned, sometimes we're not able to change our situations or influence the problem we're experiencing. And in those cases, it's really essential to focus on those aspects of what we can control. And in those cases, our thoughts, but more importantly, it is our feelings and those emotions. And when we talk about emotions, I wanna be very clear. It's not only what you're feeling as to anger, frustration, um, disappointment, overwhelmed. Those, yes, are definitely the emotional pieces, but it's also those bodily reactions that are also feelings that we need to pay attention to. The tension in your neck, the sweats, the shakes, the headaches, um, the tension in your shoulders, things of that nature. Those are also feelings that we need to be mindful of when we're taking our inventory of how stress changes in our body and those various cues that we are given as that stress level intensifies. We want to be able to intervene when stress is at a lower level where it's more manageable because as it increases and intensifies, it becomes that, more, that much more challenging to overcome. So unpack your emotions in order to regain that control. Process what the feelings are and how they look differently for everyone else and very much it's personal to you. The one thing though that is consistent is that expectations shape our reality. And when we have a certain perception of a situation and how it's going to go, and we focus all of our energy on how that's going to go, we have no control over that. 
it's going to happen the way it's going to happen. So we want to avoid not having expectations disappointed or not met. So it's really looking at setting expectations that are realistic to the situation and that are realistic to what it is in your grasp, which is all expectations about your own abilities, your own paths moving forward and the steps that you're going to take to achieve the outcome that you're wanting. Not expectations with regards to anything outside of you. Because then that's just gonna brew frustration, it's gonna brew disappointment because that is not something that is in your ability to manipulate um, and it's just not tangible. So look at what's important to you and do what feels right to you. And the reason that I'm bringing that up now is because that's going to be a very clear message that I'm going to highlight when we're talking about whether or not you are going to disclose um, and how you're going to disclose to potential employers that you may require additional support. Or if you have been diagnosed with a mental illness, your comfortability with sharing that. When you're able to regain that control over how you're best managing current situations of stress, then when you create your personal plan, you can actually start appreciating um, those various techniques that can actually be applied to the workforce um, that some of us tend to not advocate for. And they're quite simple accommodations that we, uh, we can really, we should be asking for. Um, and yet, you know, because of stigma, because of judgment, um, and because of just that competition factor of not wanting to appear weak or um, unsuccessful in fulfilling what employers' expectations are, advocating and having the skill of self-advocacy is the greatest power and the greatest strength that you can actually show your employer. So when we're looking at choosing to disclose, um, I want us to think of, it, think of it in this particular way, first and foremost. When you meet someone new, you know, are you one of those people who immediately share personal and you know, details about your life? Or are you someone who holds back such information and shares only sort of those deeply private things about yourself with the selected few? Do you keep your circle small? Now this sharing of personal details about your life, so your feelings, your thoughts, memories, experiences, and other such things, that is disclosure in its purest form. That is self-disclosure. You are revealing to someone else something very intimate and private about you. And yet we do do that in our social environments. When we're meeting new people, when we're you know, meeting new friends, we do share a little bit more about ourselves and our lives. However, when we're looking at disclosure from the perspective of a workplace, that changes a little bit. Now, disclosure in the term of employment is really looking at disclosure as the act of revealing information about your health, either your psychological, so your, your mental health, or your physical health in the workplace. And this is not something that you are obligated to do by any means. Um, even if you're asked, you do not have to share whether or not you do have a mental illness or a mental health um, concern. That is something that is a very much your personal choice. And it's about your comfortability with whether or not you disclose to someone and how much you disclose to someone. Self-disclosure is a remarkable, I'll be honest, remarkable yet complex communication process that has a very powerful impact on how our relationships with others form, how those relationships progress and how they're endured. Now how we share, what we share and when we share are just a few of those factors that can actually influence whether or not a self-disclosure is effective and appropriate. So self-disclosure does impact those various relationships and it's a crucial building block to um, the romantic and intimate relationships that you are establishing and absolutely a vital um, component to social relationships and family relationships. However, when you are 
within that peer, colleague, professional network type of relationship um, umbrella or bucket, if you will, that's where you need to have a little bit more awareness and consciousness as to who the audience is, who are you displaying to, the timing of it, and more importantly, what are you hoping to achieve from disclosing that you may have a mental illness or there might be some struggles um, with your mental health well-being in certain situations and environments. So you're a mixture, I guess you can say, of openness um, as well as personality um, can really guide the decision to self-disclosure. So you want to look at sort of the various factors that may help facilitate that self-disclosure, help you decide whether or not you want to disclose to a potential employer um, or even a friend or a family member, whomever it really truly is, your comfortability. So you want to look at it from, you know, maybe you are wanting to share that experience because you want to educate someone else. So I have shared in some of my um, presentations, both live as well as at conferences and whatnot, that I do have a social anxiety. And yet I talk for a living in front of people. So it really just speaks to, regardless of what your challenges are, they are something that can be managed and overcome with the proper tools, as well as the comfortability to advocate for the various support um, and accommodations in order to fulfill that. It's about looking at the importance of first disclosing something of your struggles to someone that you trust. Don't go big, start small. Um, you know, look at someone that is very close to you in order to get comfortable with even role playing or scripting out how you are going to advocate, how you are going to share and reveal your experiences in order to achieve what it is that you want, which is an open understanding. You want to be able to walk away feeling gratified and satisfied with how you've portrayed yourself, what it is you want to communicate moving forward as to your needs. But more importantly as well is that when you demonstrate such um, powerful strength in sharing your own stories, it does help others to share their own. And that's one thing I have to sort of take on a sidebar that from the keep me safe perspective and knowing that some of you as campus ambassadors have been um, true champions in advocating and educating your peers on talking, talking openly about just mental health and needing support and guidance, you need to start doing the same um, with regards to your own um, needs and your own comfortabilities because uh, True modeling happens um, when you are open with your own experiences. So if yes, if you've decided to disclose some of your experiences, some of your challenges, um, maybe, you know, there is a mental illness, maybe there's also a learning disability in that you struggle with memory or you struggle with tests or you struggle with, um, being able to to read things quickly those are all aspects of self-disclosure that are equally important to share only if you're comfortable so there are some hows some do's and don'ts with regards to disclosure as well as sort of the appropriate timing um, from a workplace standpoint so the do's and don'ts of disclosure so the do's so focus on your skills your abilities and your personal qualities. So what can you do? Always go into a situation highlighting your strengths um, and really painting a picture of pride and confidence in what it is that you are able to do. Provide information that is relevant to your ability to that job. Prepare for how to respond to questions about your disability or health issues or challenges and struggles. Um, you might want to be prepared with a brief you know, description or information on what that, that challenge may be. So if there is a diagnosis that you've had, 
um, or you have had experience with regards to various challenges, already come uh, prepared with um, that information. Provide examples of how you have managed some of those struggles. Um, also provide examples of how you have met challenges in the past. You know, a lot of employers now, not only are they looking at what someone's educational experience is, but they are really highlighting with regards to personal um, characteristics and personal traits because personality is something that we all sort of carry through regardless of what our experiences are. And we can definitely be in an interview and walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, but after some time, our, our true selves and comfortability sets in that we show someone who we actually are. And I would encourage you to do that right from the beginning. Um, complete transparency is um, really the, the best and greatest characteristic within someone's personality traits um, that employers do like to see and do value. Some of the don'ts um, is with regards to don't allow your disability or challenges to become the focus of your application. So this is where, again, that highlighting of appropriate when um, is going to be critical for your decision. We don't want to also assume that the employer is going to view it in a negative way. How you present um, your challenges is going to be really a means of demonstrating that you yourself do not see these as weaknesses. You see them as a part of who you are and not as a hindrance to what it is that you can do for that employer within that particular role. And it's also important that, you know, not to assume that the employer will actually understand. Um, and I'll be honest with you through my um, career path and, and I've had some significant experience in various careers. Um, a lot of employers do not necessarily have the appreciation for the struggles um, that employees might experience and the supports that they might require. And while here in Canada um, and the US based on our legislation and our laws, employers have to accommodate um, for various disabilities, including mental health concerns, um, and though in other countries, that is not the case. So it's really important to, to be that advocate um, and to be that source of accurate information that pertains specifically to you. So the when, um, and again, this is in context of employment. You know, there are basically three stages. There's the application stage, there's the interview stage, potentially that's a two process and then offering the job or when you start the job. So those are three different um, avenues as to do you say and disclose um, that there are some challenges or do you approach it in a way that um, you don't? And again, it's purely personal. Um, it's completely up to you. It's completely up to the vibe that you get from the interviewer um, or even that particular employer as to whether or not they are accommodating, willing and understanding that everybody handles situations differently and there may be certain things that will, be, that will need to be put in place in order for you to be successful um, in fulfilling what you know your potential is. So I do not see um, within the application stage, there is really no benefit in declaring whether or not you have an illness, disability, or there's challenges. Um, it's not really the forefront of highlighting that there may be certain accommodations or strategies that you would require. Um, the only thing that I caution is that if there is a gap that is left in your employment history because of um, some self-care, or um, other aspects of taking care of your well being during that hiatus, then be prepared to potentially need to explain what that is, but explain it in a way that you feel comfortable um, and that in a way that you are able to highlight that there hasn't been uh, a negative impact on your abilities or your learning during that particular gap. And again, there is absolutely no legal obligation that you have. 
um, especially here in, in Ontario or in Canada, um, to share with a potential employer or even an actual employer that there are specific health or safety concerns um, unless it can impact your ability to fulfill the job in which they've described. So if you make it to the interview stage, this is where you do, you can decide um, to tell the employer about your disability at this point, um, not in the perspective of necessarily a hindrance to your fulfillment of that role, but more importantly about highlighting some adjustments or accommodation strategies with regards to completing um, either interview tests or even questions. And then when offering the job or when starting the job, if you haven't already, it's at this stage that you may choose to disclose your disability. Um, and though, again, you have the complete right not to. It really is looking at what your comfortability is um, and looking at how much you wanna share, if anything at all. Now, I for myself, while not necessarily diagnosed, I have lived experience with regards to various situations, various circumstances where my stress level has definitely intensified and has impacted my ability to reach my full potential. And I've learned to identify various strategies that can actually help me. So those sort of like best practices, if you will, to fulfill those obligations in an effective, productive and successful way. And it's not about illnesses, it's not about disabilities, it's really looking at from your perspective as a human being in wanting to put your you know, fullest potential and live your life to the fullest, what can you put into practice? What can you advocate for? Um, what can you see if it exists? What can you ask for that's actually going to allow you to achieve that? That's really how I identify um, the comfortability of disclosure and how I envision um, that to, to happen. So these strategies that I'm gonna sort of just peruse through and, and go through are just suggestions, right? And they're suggestions for discussions that you may want to have um, with potential employers or with your employer now, and not necessarily direct advice, okay? It's again, a matter of your personal choice. I'm just presenting it in various categories that um, can be adaptable from your experience as a student into situations that you may face within the workplace. So looking at those in a way that um, can really just allow you to, to do your work. And it's important to investigate company policies to see their flexibility um, around accommodations, but also around their their policies in supporting their staff's mental well being. So, some accommodation strategies so, adaptability and flexibility. Um, so, if there are certain responsibilities that you have outside of that sort of work world um, that can have an impact, look at you know, asking for and, and, and evaluating whether or not they are flexible or reasonable in your hours of work or your need to travel or meeting deadlines, things of that nature. Um, attention to detail is something that a lot of employers do look at as um, characteristics of strength, if you will, of, of your ability to do the job. However, um, that could be something that you struggle with. So it's not to highlight it, and though it's to look at various strategies that can actually lessen um, the ability for that to have a negative impact on the quality of your work. So ask if the employer provides training, um, reduce or eliminate distractions for yourself, break large tasks into smaller tasks, things of that nature. Um, do they permit shorter breaks with, with declines if your you know, mind gets a little distracted or wanders? Um, are you able to request that the instructions and assignments be given in writing? So some of these accommodations actually can also not only apply to a workplace environment, but if you choose to continue on an educational path, um, these can also be accommodations that you request from your student advisors. Exposure to distractions. 
um, some tolerance of stressful situations um, as well and looking at what the policies are around that. Um, reality is we all get exposed to distressed people, um, whether it be, you know, colleagues, our superiors, um, or even our friends. So what does the environment or what type of strategies can really help you problem solve and analyze that particular situation so you do not become more stressed and overwhelmed. Um, if you have difficulty with recalling information or, or some, some memory challenges, especially when there's a lot of information and a lot going on um, inside your mind, there are different strategies and accommodations um, that you can request as well. That does not highlight that you have any disability at all. It's just a matter of advocating for certain parameters, certain guidelines, um, and certain allowances, if you will, to, to make you the best version of you. Now, while dealing with stress, even pain and suffering, it's unavoidable in life. And being dragged down by these situations, though, is not. There are a lot of different ways that we cope. There's a lot of different strategies that we can start using in order to minimize um, us getting dragged down and not really living to our fullest potential. And all of these various methods and techniques suit our own very unique personalities and our own very unique and personal needs. So when an activity that causes someone else stress in one individual may be, you know, something that gets someone else, whoops, what the heck, excited or rejuvenated, it doesn't matter whether you cope like anyone else. The important thing is that you engage in those activities that, and find effective coping mechanisms that help you thrive and build resiliency and that you find your voice and advocate for various things that are within your grasp and within reason for employers and potential employers to provide you in order for you to reach your fullest potential. When you're looking at things, you know, the things to consider when deciding whether or not to disclose anything about your, your life, your experiences, um, your challenges, or even your disabilities and mental illnesses. Remember how and when to do it. Remember how much information you wanna give and focus on your own mental health problem impacts. Like how is it going to impact you if you don't say something? Um, that's a really good place to start. You don't need to feel obligated. It is your, ultimately it's your personal choice as to whether or not you disclose anything about you personally, whether it be a physical health, mental health or just even personal experiences you can say as much or as little as you want to and you can truly share with whom you want to if you need more support though in sort of provided a little bit of guidance as to whether or not there is something in your experiences that you should be sharing or not um, or maybe there are experiences right now that you are struggling with and you need a little bit of guidance and support there is help for it out there. Um, and it's just a matter of being open to the help that you can get. So know that you're not alone in sort of the uncomfortable feelings, especially right now, given COVID-19. And for some of us, myself included, I live alone. I, I'm not having that same interaction that I've had before. And that can be in its own experiences, um, a very challenging and unique feeling for me. So regardless of how big our problems may seem, I know and I want you to walk away knowing that you're not alone in this and that it's okay to reach out for support if you need. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to seek help and it's okay to speak out. Um, so please, if you are struggling at this point in time, don't suffer in silence. Break that silence and it breaks the stigma. Nobody can solve your problems. And though there are people and there is support out there that can help you figure out how to better deal with them. Because we all deserve, you deserve to feel good and to be successful.
So before I open up the floor to any questions, um, I'll leave it on this screen with regards to resources available for support. Um, they are all um, free self-help resources, as well as some mental health and wellness professional support in connecting with, um, a Kiwi, with either a Kiwi Safe counselor or another counselor. So more of that professional guidance. So I will open the floor to any questions. Perfect. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. And hope you guys are doing well, staying safe, um, and do stay connected. Uh, don't feel shy and do reach out if you need help. Wow, oh, great. Thank you, Christina, for your presentation. It was very insightful. Well, guys, we just finished today. Thank you for your present uh, for being here today. Uh, just to remember, these are the QR codes for the session three and the session four. Uh, the code for the session three is June. The, se the session four is wellness. Uh, fill out the form and answer the feedback and include the code to get your uh, feedback done. And uh, you have to do this by midnight tonight. So, and tomorrow morning, we're gonna have the results for the sessions. Uh, remember to check our website. We have a lot of updates there. We have been including uh, this presentation probably from uh, Christina is gonna be there available as well. Um, and any other content that we can share with you guys. And I hope I can see you tomorrow. Tomorrow is our third and last day. I uh, hope you have enjoyed today. Uh, give some comments and see you tomorrow at 3 p.m. for Toronto, 4 p.m. for 8.